Welcome to this module on research ethics, which is part of the RISPAC Erasmus project. And this is part one. What we will try to do in this module is describe the definition of research ethics, say a few words about the history of research ethics, discuss the basic and additional principles of research ethics, say a few words on ethical frameworks, declarations and legislation, whether national or European, and also talk about informed consent. And let's start with the definition. Research ethic refers to the analysis of ethical issues that may occur when we have a people as participants in our research. And if we look at the Horizon 2020, ethical research conduct implies the application of not only of fundamental ethical principles, but also of the relevant legislation to the research we're undertaking, and that is in all possible domains of research. Now, how about the history? If we look at the, uh, this editorial in our Journal of Palliative Medicine in 2019, we will see that the first publication on research ethics appeared in Palliative Medicine back in 1994 and discuss several issues of uh, ethical issues in research. If we look at the publications in the 90s, we see that what authors were dealing in those days was the placebo control trials and whether it was ethical to use placebo as uh, subjects in trials in palliative care. In the turning of the century in 2001, uh, a breakthrough happened when the editorial board of um, our Journal of Palliative Medicine required all authors to provide a statement outlining uh, on ethical issues in their studies. In that editorial, if we look at the goals of research, we see that of course, the main goal is to protect human participants, and particularly those who are more vulnerable. And we know that in palliative care, many of our patients can be potentially vulnerable. And we're going to discuss um, a further issues on, the, um, on vulnerability later on in this presentation. What we also need to ensure, and this is another goal of research ethics, is that the um, the study is conducted in a way that serves the interests not only of individuals, but also of groups and society as a whole. And this is the issue of research validity. How uh, needed is the research that we're going to undertake? Because if it's not needed, then it doesn't answer um, a real question that is there, then possibly um, it should not be done. Another thing is to uh, explore the uh, ethical soundness of a study and that is looking at issues such as uh, management of risk, protection of the confidentiality of the data of patients and also if the uh, researchers have uh, undertaken the uh, process of informed consent. Now, as we've said in the overview, we're going to look at several ethical features of research, and um, some of them are the basic ethical principles, uh, the declaration, charters, guidelines, and a few words on legislation, European legislation on the subject of um, research ethics, and also mentioned um, uh, a couple of ethical frameworks that we may use in our everyday clinical practice and research. So the uh, basic ethical principles were described by these two gentlemen, Beauchamp and Childers, back in 1979. And I'm sure you've all heard of them. And it is beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, and justice. And we're going to elaborate 
on them uh, in a little while. So before we discuss the four basic principles, let me introduce to you another five additional ones. And I'm sure you all know them as values in palliative care. And those are integrity, respect, dignity, as well as fidelity and justification. So let's look at the first two basic ethical principles. And this is beneficence. And beneficence is the obligation to do good, to support the well-being of uh, our participants in a study. And of course, in order to do, to do that, we must be able to understand uh, a person's best interests, the way they are describing them, and also be able to judge if a, a modality, a treatment, or an intervention that we are proposing will be good, will be for the benefit of the patient, or probably it could be futile or sometimes overly burdensome for that particular participant. If we look at the principle of non-maleficence, this is above all do no harm, and in Latin premium non nocere. And uh, the other issue that I'm sure you're all aware in everyday clinical practice, and it's the same in research, we have to balance for the principle of double effect. What does that mean? It means that probably an intervention that we are proposing has a benefit, but there, at the same time, there are risks involved. And I'm sure you all know the, uh, the possible side effects of drugs and medications that we are using. While our intention is to do good, possibly in, in some people, we may do harm. Another additional principle is justification. And justification defines whether an act is morally right or wrong. The third principle is the principle of autonomy. And this comes from the Greek word of auto, which is after and nomos, and it defines self-determination. It is the right of human beings to make choices and take actions based on their own personal values and beliefs. And this is something that we are trying to protect and we're trying to respect in palliative care, and it's very important for our patients. Another thing that's closely related to autonomy is integrity, and it relates to the intactness or wholeness of self, and also respect, respect for the person, respect for the person's value, their needs, and their wishes. And we come now to the last of the uh, four basic principles, which is justice. And justice does not only apply to an individual, a person, a participant, but also it applies to justice to the, uh, the carers, the family who may be taking care of the patient, but also to the healthcare system as a whole. If we uh, try to be just for an individual at the same time we have to consider the legitimate needs of others that are involved in care so on a personal level on an individual level in order to comply with the principle of justice we have to avoid over and under treatment and try to provide care in the most appropriate setting for the patient probably the uh, the setting that the uh, patient may wishes to be cared for. And this also brings up the issue of resource allocation, which is um, in the healthcare system, how do we manage our finite resources? For instance, we're in a rural area, we don't have too many specialized um, services of um, uh, palliative care. And how do we treat our patients? Who do we take in and who do we, uh, unfortunately deny care how do we make that hierarchy of the provision of care so this goes to resource allocation and uh, at the same time we know that in palliative care carers whether it be family or other friends that are caring for the patient 
also have needs and we have to consider and address this reasonable needs of other and try not to overburden or overwhelm these carers. The other two additional uh, ethical principles are fidelity and this, this is the, uh, it describes the value of remaining true to uh, our professional values while we're focusing, focusing on the patient care. And also dignity may be closely related to autonomy and the challenges uh, that are inherent in respecting it. But also it may relate to the empathetic and equitable care to our patients. Let's look now at the ethical challenges in everyday clinical practice. So we've described the four basic principles and these are considered as the deontological principles. And uh, the, the two frameworks that we're going to discuss uh, a little bit more in our next slides is the uh, four quadrants approach and another one is the seed house grid. However, in, um, in our everyday practice, uh, there are other uh, issues and other frameworks that we may use. And this is the utilitarianism. It's also the virtue of ethics or the ethics of care, of everyday care. And this is something we come across uh, every day. So the more easily incorporate individual contents that we do with rule-based deontological frameworks would be that of the ethics of care. And this is described in that interesting papers that we, I mentioned before. Let us now say a few words on declaration, charters and guidelines that guide the um, ethical principles in research. I'm sure you all know that it all started with the Nuremberg trial, where the first Nuremberg Code actually forbade researchers to use um, uh, human beings uh, in their experiments involuntarily without um, their, will, their will and uh, without telling them what they're going to undergo. And uh, apart from the Nuremberg Code, there are the um, Declaration of Human Rights for Thinking. I think the first one was in 1964, and a number of them um, came out later. There's also the um, uh, Council for International Organizations of Medical Science Guidelines. It's the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union and the European Convention on Human Rights. And there are a number of um, European Union regulations like this uh, 536, which is especially on clinical trials. More declaration and regulation on ethics from the European Union. There's one on the implementation of good clinical practice in clinical trials. There's another one on the protection of personal data. There are more on um, pediatrics, uh, other one uh, which are on um, the new technologies and a recent one of November 2021, which is on artificial intelligence and the use of uh, this new modality in uh, trials. So let's look at the, uh, the first uh, framework that I mentioned before. This is the four quadrants approach. And what do we do in this framework? In this framework, we sort of uh, try to figure out the ethical challenges that we have to face, looking at them in different domains. For instance, there are things that have to do with the medical indication of the um, uh, of the thing that we are proposing in our research. We have to consider what is the medical problem, what are the goals of treatment, what are the alternatives, and let the patient know about the treatment options that they have, and also the likely success of treatment. There's another domain up in the, in the top right, which is the patient preferences that we have to consider. 
have we informed the, uh, the participants on the risks and benefits? Do they have uh, a capacity to understand what we're talking about? Have we considered their preferences and those of their surrogates? We also have to consider quality of life. Uh, we are considering an intervention, but what is the effect it has on functionality, on the current lifestyle and the uh, individual's independence? What is expected time of recovery and what may be the possible problems resulting from the treatment that we are proposing? And there are other factors as well, contextual features like conflicts of interest, personal interest or financial incentives, and also research conflicts or hospital pressures on the researchers. And apart from the framework of the uh, four quadrants, we have the sit house ethical greed. And you can see in this one that we have uh, like um, four different rectangulars with different colors. And if we go from the center to the periphery, you find uh, in the blue uh, rectangular diagram there, you find issues that have to do with autonomy. And uh, how do we uh, create uh, autonomy and how do we respect autonomy? In the pink area, we have the other two uh, main ethical principles, which we need to consider what may be the benefits and what may be the risks. And uh, we have to, to do beneficence and non-maleficence. And of course, we have to keep promises and tell the truth. In the, uh, in the next green rectangular, we have uh, issues that have to do with um, the consequences. Uh, what would be the consequences for the individual, for a, a group, society? While on the, the outer uh, gray area, we need to consider what are the resources that we have, what are the, uh, the risks, uh, what is the current practice, and what may be the, uh, the problems, uh, the degree of uncertainty in the current practice that we are proposing. What is the law and is what we are proposing uh, within the demands of the law? And it's also the, the wishes of others and uh, definitely the resources that we have available. So what we can do when we have a problem, well, we really uh, write down the, uh, the different aspects of the intervention that we are proposing in the different boxes and we try to cover all area. And if they're not relevant, it's good just to write down that it's irrelevant instead of just leaving it empty. So when we have put everything down, we can sort of tell other people the way that we have thought in order to reach a decision. Because we know that in many of our ethical challenges, the way we approach the issues has pros and cons and this doesn't mean that everybody is going to arrive at the same decision. But with that framework, we can sort of show other people how we thought in order to arrive to a conclusion on the ethical issue that we are facing. Let us now look more closely to this paper I was talking about, which is a systematic review of the ethical principles that are reported by specialist palliative care pr practitioners. Um, it is uh, an accumulated systematic review, mostly qualitative studies, and the authors screened more than 8,000 uh, records, and those came from nine countries. And um, what they put down is the challenges related to specific scenarios. And rather than the application of the, of the main um, ethical principles that we were talking about. So these challenges that they described occurred at all levels, whether it be at bedside or at an institutional level or in society or in the, uh, in the policy uh, or there were policy issues involved. So the challenges were organized by the author in six main themes. 
Those had to do with the application of ethical principles, how we are delivering clinical care, how we are working with families, engaging with institutional structures and values, navigating with societal values and expectations, and also issues about the philosophy of palliative care. And those were the six main themes. And if we break up this uh, main themes in the 23 sub themes, according to the authors, we see that in, in the first uh, domain, the uh, application of ethical principle, we have the, um, the basic ethical principles of autonomy. It's autonomy, dignity, truth telling, uh, the doctrine of double effect and uh, the equity of care. This is uh, justice here and fidelity. In the second part, the delivering of clinical care, we have the um, issues like clinical care and decision making, confidentiality, what are our goals of care? We've talked about this goals of care in the, uh, as you remember, in the four quadrants um, uh, framework, mental capacity of our patients, and also the issue of communicating with patients and families. In the third part, we have working with families and how do we care and support for the family? Who are the family decision makers? Are there issues um, uh, on genetics involved? And of course, it's the, uh, the privacy issues. In the fourth part, we have um, the institutional structure of values. So there may be a conflict with institutional policy among the um, uh, the practitioners and the institution, or uh, differences in um, institutional resource allocation. And another thing that we face in our everyday clinical practice, we may be having a conflict between the healthcare staff on where our resources should be focused. Also navigating on societal values and expectations. We have the issues of assisted dying with conflicts with um, wider uh, other rules of the society. Regulations or laws that may be applicable in a certain country. We have this um, the issue of euthanasia in the, um, in the Netherlands and Belgium and other countries. And also access to specialist palliative care. And last, we have the philosophy of palliative care. And I'm sure that you have all faced in your uh, everyday practice, you know, questions that arise. Uh, do we give antibiotics to our patients at the end of life? Do we do um, palliative sedation? And for what reasons? Putting a nasogastric tube uh, and feeding patients, is that really palliative care? And what is really in the philosophy of palliative care and the ethical issues that may arise from discussing about these issues? And if we look at this very interesting uh, table in the same uh, uh, publication, we see what I've been talking about and what the authors describe as ethical challenges in everyday practice. And they can also be in research. Do we administer antibiotics or blood transfusions or do we do electrolyte management and uh, hydration and nutrition, especially at the end of life? Do we do uh, DNAR, deactivate pacemakers? Um, do we take lab tests and when do we stop taking lab, lab laboratory tests at the end of life? Uh, symptom management, how far do we go? Uh, alternative therapies and the use of opioids. And I'm sure you agree that these are everyday ethical challenges that we have to consider in our practice, all of us. And let us now consider the informed consent. So the Nuremberg Code and the Helsinki Declaration really remain the foundation of principles of consent in research. Consent is actually a process. It's not the patient saying, yes, I agree to take part or no, I don't agree. A simple yes or no is not enough. It is a process by which the participant 
can understand what we're talking about and decide for themselves after we've um, um, told them what the, uh, the study is all about, the benefits and risks involved in taking part in a study. For consent to be valid, uh, the, um, the human being, the, uh, the participant, has to be properly informed. And also, the uh, consent should be freely given without any pressure, direct or indirect, such as coercion, threats, or persuasion. And is an informed consent always required? Of course it is required when we have to do with uh, human participants, whether they be adults or children, if they're incompetent or incapacitated, or uh, if they're healthy volunteers, immigrants, or any other group such as prisoners. And also we need to take an informed consent if we're collecting uh, human genetic material or any kind of biological samples or if um, we're collecting uh, patients uh, or uh, volunteers or carers who have taking part in a study in their personal data. So very briefly, what are the prerequisitions of an informed consent? In order for our participants to sign an informed consent, they must be sufficiently informed on the type of research or um, intervention that we are proposing. So in order to be able to um, understand this information, they must really uh, be able to, to have a cognitive uh, capacity and be able to comprehend that information. Um, they also must have the power of free choice. The informed consent can be given or can be withhold. And this is at the discretion of our participants. And also, the, um, another prerequisition when we are asking them to sign an informed consent is that they must be ensured that the data that they are providing is properly protected. So what are the questions that we may receive when we ask a patient to sign an informed consent? Uh, they will ask, do I have to take part? And what will happen to me if I take part? What is exactly your, the intervention that you are proposing to me, whether it be drug or approach? And what are the alternative treatments if I don't uh, wish to follow the, the intervention that you are proposing? What are the possible side effects and what are the possible benefits? So the patient should be having a good um, cost and risk ratio in what we are proposing. They may ask what will happen at the end of the study if uh, the intervention that we are proposing is an effective one. Will it stop by the end of the study? And how is the uh, personal data uh, confidentiality ensured? who will have access to the data that I'm providing, providing and whom can I contact if I need to. So all these are questions that we may receive from our patients or whoever is taking part in research. So this is a, a template of, a, of an informed consent. And of course, in order to get one, we must assess the patient's mental status. We must use a simple language we must provide the uh, participants with the, um, of course, the title of, our, of the study and a contact person, which usually is the uh, main investigator. We must tell them about the, uh, the purpose of the study and the background, why we think this study was important and needed to be done. Tell them about the different procedures and the methodology we're going to use. Tell them about the risks and possible benefits from their participation. Uh, ensure that the, uh, the data will be confidential, as we've said, and they're participating voluntarily. They can withdraw at any time without this having consequences on their care. We must give them adequate time to think about it, possibly discuss it with their loved ones, and then they can give uh, an informed consent and they need to sign it. And uh, possibly uh, we need to tell them or 
possibly they ask us whether they, we can report to them the results of the study. Uh, besides the signed informed consent, there may be other verbal and non-written, but in order for this one to be valid, we have it had to be witnessed by an independent witness. We have the dual consent, which is, for instance, we have a teenager who has a guardian and they need to sign, but also the teenager can understand what we are proposing, and this is an assent consent. An advanced consent means that we... Um, uh, we're proposing something to the patient that may happen in the future and we ask them for an advanced consent and there's a pro proxy consent when we have a legal representative or of our patient. Is it always necessary? It is when we have to do with um, human subjects or we are collecting data in a manner that will allow the identification of the participants and uh, we don't need one if we're getting the, um, uh, the view of an officer. And this concludes our uh, part one, which I need to say is um, uh, part one of research ethics, uh, uh, which is a project uh, funded by the European Commission, the RISPAC. Thank you very much.